my name is Frank Rieta, and my background is as a developer and, and with a computer science and information security. I'm out of Atlanta, and I work with a company that I started that specializes in building web applications where security matters. And what I'm here to talk with you about today is data breaches and how they how you as a developer can help prevent them because history has taught us to this point that when you develop an application and it starts amassing customer data and we depend upon historically normative means of protecting information, it fails time and time again. There's connected. So the slides are up on speaker deck and there's a paper for this as well. So if you want the long version, feel free to go ahead and get that. And I have two blue FIDO uh, universal two-factor tokens to give out. So be ready for your questions, because usually that's what we're going to do is discuss. So it could be a question for a friend or um, something that you're dealing with or something based on the talk. So let me start out with a fundamental axiom of security, and that is that security is not an on-off switch. You can't just flip this SSL on switch, which would be great because you take your data that is coming from your customers and you encrypt it while it's in transit across the network to your services and everything is good. And why you would turn logging off, I have no idea. But so since we can't depend on just network security, we have application security. So my definition for that is the following. Application security is the area of InfoSec that is concerned with protecting data and privacy. And it's, it's a special case from adversaries who have access to the software system as a whole. The term adversaries here matters because not all adversaries are hackers. An adversary could be a federal law enforcement agent in the same way we speak of having an adversarial court system. It could be an employee who has legitimate access to some areas but not to others and is exceeding the access that they should have. It is, encompasses all those concepts. And the purpose is to make the application itself more resilient from attack. So we're not just going to hide it between, behind a firewall or turn on SSL or turn on monitoring or, or any of these other great things that we can do and presume that we have security. So let me start with um, what is a data breach. And I know everyone likes cats, so I have this little stick figure that has a floppy ear. Uh, and so this unauthorized person has access to sensitive data and the means to read it. That is a breach. The second caveat is important. This is why encryption can be used to say, wait, we didn't have a breach in the, in the first place. So when you have a laptop that is locked in a car and has sensitive data on it, and that laptop is stolen, and the laptop is not encrypted, then we, by law, say that there was a data breach of those personal records because you cannot prove that the person who stole it did not access it. So even if they just formatted the computer because they wanted it for the value of the computer itself, you have a data breach and you have to announce it. And similarly, if it's encrypted though, you often can say, wait a second, did they have the sensitive data? It was encrypted. Did they have the means to read it? No, they would have to have the key. And that key was not present with the information that they stole. There's not a data breach in that case. So, and this isn't just this physical case. When someone breaks into your Amazon account and they are mining Bitcoin, then you still have to declare a breach if that access that they had would have given them access to your customer records or to your server instances or whatever you have. You, you have no proof that they didn't access it, therefore you have a problem. And this happens a lot. So this diagram shows a whole host of data breaches in the last year or few years, and the size of the circle represents a measure of the number of records breached. And if you are like me, and this makes you as a developer want to hit the panic button, then that would be a reasonable thing. However, and this is very important, the fundamental problems are not, it's not just an on and off switch, and there's some basics that we can look at. So this is a chart from the Verizon data breach report that was, um, came out this year. And of the web hosting attacks, 
or, or web application attacks. They, these are enterprise class systems. They had a sample size of 205 in this case. Over 50% were through the use of stolen credentials. So someone's password got stolen, especially staff members, and that led to the breach of confidential information. Um, we could go down the list. We have backdoors, SQL injection. You know, looking at some of these things that I like to think about as a developer, forced browsing and, and, and cross-site scripting, these are much smaller percentages. So if we solve this authentication problem, then a large number of these real-world breaches would not have happened, especially with two-factor authentication for staff members. So these are major preventable problems, compromised accounts, users picking terrible passwords and being allowed to do so, automated technical um, things like uh, metasploit attacks, working, this is just lack of patching, just common everyday things from the OWASP top 10. This is stuff that developers should just take care of as part of how we do our work, as part of code craftsmanship and you know, our own ethics. And generally poor security, including unencrypted backups. And this is what got Bitly in trouble last year. So they had, their production systems were not breached, but a copy of the production database was present on a backup that a developer credential had access to. Now, they've made changes since this incident, but again, it's, it's the lack of defense in depth that can lead to a lot of trouble. So this quote came from 2004 by um, Mr. Greg Hogland and Gary McGraw published a book on exploiting software, and I read this right before I started graduate school, and it said, most outsourced software is full of backdoors. Now I'd argue we could use the word vulnerabilities instead of backdoors, but they used that word then. But now listen now, this is the money part. Companies that commission this kind of software have not traditionally paid any attention to security at all. And in the intervening years when I've worked in this space, I would say this is very consistent with what I've seen in practice. Because the concept is, as a graduate professor of mine said, security is not a functional requirement. It's not a feature, it's an attribute. We can worry about it later. But the problem when you do this is when you kick this can down the road and you kick it down the road again, and, and you, the, this, um, this cus, um, everyone thinks security is someone else's job, and what ends up happening is no one's taking care of it. So uh, the, the customer thinks the developer's taking care of it, the developer thinks ops is taking care of it, ops thinks that Heroku's taking care of it. They exclaim that in their terms of service that you're really responsible for your application. And so everyone exclaims it and thinks it's someone else's problem, but it, in the end, no one's taking care of it. So I'm gonna talk about development, um, developing with security in mind. And we start with security is a requirement, fundamentally, full stop. And it has to be addressed. And in order to address it, your first step is you need to actually understand that not all information is created the same. So in a governmental context, you hear of top secret and secret information. In a business context, you hear of PII. But this isn't particularly useful. You need a information classification system. So um, check this out. So this is a basic one uh, with five areas. And one of the mistakes that is often made is that our employers, our companies think that this is up to, you know, boards of directors thinks that this is all up to us. We can choose what is best. Above this line, you have public information. That's like on your website. Who really cares? Internal use. So these are things that if it got found out, it's a bad day for the company, but no one outside of the company really cares. Down below the red line, you have stuff that's defined by law with, with prescribed bad things that happen when, when this information is breached, PII, highly sensitive data, encryption keys and such. And in the middle, you have this, this uncanny valley between the yellow and the red line, which is information that your customers consider confidential. And when that's breached, they post on Facebook about how you're violating their privacy. So even though there's no law that says that this is a problem, this can become a real problem. So. Since this is a requirement, security, and we want to include it in the development process, one tool we have at our disposal as developers is user stories with security constraints and abuser stories, which are user stories from the point of view of a malicious adversary. And so in case some, anyone here doesn't know what a user story is, the Mike Cohn definition is thus. It is a written description of 
um, is a written description of the functionality. Um, it, there's conversations about the story that flesh out the detail, and then there's tests, card, conversation, and confirmation. So when I'm writing in Pivotal Tracker and I say, as a so-and-so, I want this, we actually can use the note section to talk about the concerns. So here's an example on the new customer. As a visitor, I can create a new account by filling in my email address and desired password. Now, we talk to the security guys, and they say, you know, I have a password cracking machine, and if the password is less than 12 characters, I'm going to make short work of it. So that would be a good idea to require longer than that. And then another person says, well, what about their emails? Can we verify that they really have this email address? So th these are some basic constraints around this feature that if a developer sees these requirements, they can change things. And if you're using device, you can turn on the device feature, and you can increase the minimum length of passwords in the config file, you're done. It adds less than half a point to the story, but it makes a difference in implementation. Uh, a customer service rep. Okay, as a staff member, I can choose a sys customer, this is called a masquerading feature, to log in as that customer to provide them with great service. Now pay attention now. This is an area for abuse. This is exactly the type of feature that can lead to a major breach like the buffer app breach when a Mongo HQ staff member had, his credential was compromised and that led to being able to access customer data um, through this. We need to have a ton of logging around this instance. Who used it when, for what purpose? We need to have staff members being required to have two-factor authentication because we go back to that Verizon report I talked about earlier. We need to, let's identify what private information the customer service agent doesn't need access to, and if it's appropriate, we can even make the database server have rules that will raise an exception. So if there's a SQL injection attack against an endpoint that is authenticated as a staff member to access information beyond which the app is designed to permit, then you can raise an exception and an air break rather than you know, give up the data. So let's look at another one that sometimes people don't do. The lawyer, as general counsel, when I have received a subpoena for all material records for a particular account and I've exhausted all my options to reject it, I work with the system admin to pull the data while not pulling unnecessary records. So this is a story you could drop in that's going to change the way the team perceives how they structure the information in the system, or how they program around it, or what technical controls are appropriate to protect things. So abuser stories, so these, this is the meat of the, the talk. The URL tweaker, let's talk about direct object reference now, which is an OWASP top 10 issue. As an authenticated customer, I can see what looks like my account number in the URL, so I change it to a number, another number so I can see what will happen. This is a simple example, but the reason for writing the story up like this is this is a very tempting for a non-technical stakeholder to say, but no one would ever do that. Why do we want to do this? Our users, just they're just not going to do that. Well, they may. As an authenticated customer, I paste HTML that includes JavaScript into every field possible to see what happens. As a malicious hacker, I want to gain access to this web application's cloud hosting account so that I can lock out the legitimate owners, delete the servers, and generally destroy their, bu their business. And if you think this is exaggerating, it really happened to code spaces in 2014. Um, here's a fun one. As a disgruntled employee who will soon be fired, I want to delete records and generally cause havoc and chaos. So this makes you think about how do you implement delete? How, what, do you use paper trail or some other thing to have a backup of things that are changed? You know, how do you have logging turned on and do you know what to do with it as part of your application architecture? The scam artist. As a scam artist, I want to obtain employee names, addresses, and socials so that I can steal their identity and finance a Corvette. So you see, this can be fun if you're like, let's war game this thing. And the, the hater, as a person with ill will towards a person whom I hate, I will do anything to find out any of their details and embarrass them and generally endanger their lives. So again, this might inform how you think about profiles and what information you contain just by realizing that this exists. So the whole point of all of this 
the whole reason that we're including user stories and adding to them security information, the reason we're writing negative user stories as part of our process is so that the business side, the product owner, and the developers can have clear understanding about some of the threats faced by the system and that that can, make in, that can help lead to informed development decisions because we cannot bolt security on at the end. We can't just install a web application and appliance and call it a day if the application itself is fundamentally vulnerable. So there's some other things we can talk about as developers, as we're going about our daily work. So one, please become familiar with the OWASP top 10. These are the top 10 ways that applications typically get pwned, and this is common amongst all web applications, not just in Rails, not just in Sinatra. Um, I mentioned two of the attack patterns out of the 10. I mentioned direct object reference, with the URL tweaker story, and I mentioned cross-site scripting with the curious editor story. Use secure headers and enable SSL um, only. So you can go to your config file, your init config slash application, it's in the environment, and turn on force SSL, and this does a couple things. It will, um, you can set the sec uh, strict transport security, but it'll also set a secure flag on, on cookies. And the reason this is important is, let's presume, like many times, we had an all SSL site, and that when someone visited port 80, that they get redirected to the SSL site, and then they log in, but we forgot to turn on force SSL. So the cookies itself were not, did not necessarily have the secure flag. Now what happens is if that, per that cookie gets set, and that person goes back to the site later on port 80, <clears throat> their browser will dutifully report the cookie over an unsecure channel. And then they'll be redirected to the secure site, but now there's an opportunity for that cookie to have been sniffed. So, however, if you turn on uh, secure only flag on the cookies and you use strict transport security, that does two things. One, the cookie won't be played in this case, and secondly, the uh, web browser will not visit over an unsecure connection. Um, so that's a feature you should use. Run automated tools such as Brakeman, Bundler Audit, Code Climate, and others. Uh, use GNUPG or PGP as part of your process. At our company, every developer gets a PGP key. We actually encrypt certain customer data, and some of our customers even have PGP now for as we send information back and forth. Um, this is particularly helpful in an environment where production database uh, copies get passed around because uh, a legacy application is very data dependent. Um, and so if it's just normal data, you'll want to encrypt it. And then practice on the OWASP Rails Good project, which is an insecure Rails application that um, you don't download it and then say, oh, that's a great way to implement this feature. Uh, you probably should understand what's going on. <laughs> and so I want to recap now. Data breaches are a super major concern, and you cannot just wish them away and you will get hacked, and if you're not hacked already, you will be hacked soon. Application security is about preventing abuse by adversaries who have access to your system. Don't presume that the bad guys are at the other end of the firewall. They are right there using your app, and you are the last line of defense. Have an information classification system because not everything is created equal. Feel free to use mine. And treat security as a fundamental requirement and you can use user stories and abuser stories like we've talked about, and um, it's a great start. And you should apply practical countermeasures that are actual technical decisions. And I would go as far as to say on the two-factor authentication that it, we are soon to the point, and we may have already passed the point, where it is no longer up to our customers, it is no longer up to our non-technical stakeholders to choose whether or not two-factor authentication is appropriate. It is coming to the point where it is a matter of developer ethics to do it right be, despite what our customers may ask because they don't have enough information to make informed decisions about the risks that they and their users face and they don't have enough information to make informed decisions about the relative costs of the security mechanisms versus um, not doing it. And this is all part of a defense and depth strategy which is to have multiple concurrent controls to protect against the worst possible thing that could happen. So we have SSL. Our staff members have to have strong passwords. Our staff members have to have a second factor. We log everything they do. We have this, we have that. 
We don't depend upon any particular single technical control to protect our application and the user's data. And that's it. <laughs>